This episode is also brought to you by Oddmo's Pizza in Canby. Handmade awesome pizza plus craft beer, wine, and cider delivered. Call them today at 503-263-8444. Welcome to Now Hear This Candy, your source for news. The threat of a possible teacher strike was avoided this week. There's a new irresistibly cute creature winning over fans, and its name is Scootaloo. Sports? It's like Lucy in the football. You want to kick a field goal, but they take it away from you. We had to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. Goal can't be in the last second of the game! And interesting conversations. Because I'm one of the strongest girls ever, and I know that for a fact. (laughs) I just really enjoy writing gossip as if I was a bear. (laughs) With an old maid daughter that make the best moonshine in the coast. (laughs) And if it would have hit me in the face, I think I would have died. I really do. It, it, it... I guarantee you would have died, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, friends, and welcome to this episode of Now Hear This Can Be. I'm your host, James Walton. Let's read the news. Canby Mayor Brian Hodson is not alone in his frustration about the governor's latest coronavirus measures targeting restaurants, bars, and gyms. At a time when they were just beginning to bounce back from the previous shutdown and without much evidence that they were significant contributors to the spread of the virus. His vexation is shared by restaurant owners and employees themselves. My feeling is restaurants are being targeted and treated unfairly, said Joan Monin owner of the Wild Hair Saloon in Canby in Oregon City. We're carrying the brunt of this pandemic. Ever since we reopened, restaurants followed the rules. Then we get shut down a second time and the numbers are still increasing. It's not being spread through the restaurants. This view is shared by Matt Morrissey, owner of one of Canby's newest restaurants, Wayward Sandwiches. Wayward has been anything but lax in his approach to the pandemic, even preemptively shutting down for a week after two of its back-of-house employees tested positive for COVID-19. As it turns out, it does not appear that the employees contracted the virus at work, and there's no evidence that any other staff or patrons were affected. Our industry as a whole has really gone above and beyond to prevent all of this, he said. The other restaurants and gym owners I know do everything in our power to make sure we are operating safely and not spreading the virus. And so I do feel we're sort of getting scapegoated here. Both Monin and Morrissey believe people are safer dining at a restaurant that is following all the social distancing guidelines for them than, for example, a gathering hosted by family or friends where such guidelines may not be as high a priority. I understand. There needs to be an abundance of caution, Morrissey said. I just don't think the case has been made that we're contributing significantly to the spread. Monin urged community members to be sensible with regard to their plans for Thanksgiving and other social gatherings and to consider the plight of local restaurants and other businesses who may end up paying the consequences. If you truly care about small businesses and want to see your favorite restaurant open, then please don't host mass gatherings during the holidays, she pleaded. I know everyone wants to hang out with their family and friends, but now, more than ever, we need people to think of the lives and the businesses being impacted by this pandemic. Morrissey, whose restaurant just celebrated its one-year anniversary last month, admitted that many hospitality businesses are struggling to stay afloat, and his is no exception. He also has friends in other parts of the country who have been forced to permanently close their businesses this year. We're a brand new business. I don't have a lot of cash sitting around, he said. I spent it all just to build this out. Plus, I employ over 20 people. And if at the end of all of this, I don't have a business, that's 20 people that can't support their families and their households. After toying with the idea of a modified version of the Light Up the Night event, the city of Canby has announced it will go virtual only for the popular annual tree lighting event at Waite Park. The city had already canceled significant features of Light Up the Night, including the parade throughout downtown Canby and pictures with Santa and Mrs. Claus at the Waite Park gazebo. However, organizers had hoped to preserve the ability for residents to gather at Waite Park to count down the moment when the tree in the park are first lit to kick off the holiday season. 
Originally, the city was set on an abbreviated event to encourage social distancing and mask wearing, a press release from the city Wednesday said. But over the last few weeks, it has become clear that we need to pare down the event even further. The virtual event will be instead be a pre-recorded video that goes live at 6.30 p.m. December 4th, featuring the whole Who Lights Up Canby winner and Mayor Brian Hodson. The video will be shared and promoted on Facebook through the Canby Current, Canby Herald, CTV Channel 5, and the Canby Area Chamber of Commerce. The Lights in Wait Park will be turned on the morning of December 4th to discourage people congregating in Wait Park at a specific time, the city said. As always, the lights will stay on until early January. The city of Canby will continue its efforts promoting the local business community and downtown Canby while maintaining social distancing guidelines. The city's economic development team recently collaborated with The Current to create the 2020 Canby Community Holiday Gift Guide campaign to remind citizens to patronize their favorite businesses this holiday season. For more information about our holiday gift guide, visit canbyfirst.com and check our episode 221 of this podcast, Shoot Your Shop. Oregon Governor Kate Brown announced Wednesday that she's loosening many restrictions she had placed just a week ago on bars, restaurants, gyms, stores, and religious organizations in order to stem the unprecedented, out-of-control spread of COVID-19. This new framework, essentially a modified version of the governor's phased approach to reopening this summer, will loosen restrictions for at least 15 Oregon counties that aren't experiencing the kind of surge seen in other regions, while leaving the strictest boundaries on 21 counties, including Clackamas. With COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations at a all-time high in her state, Governor Brown urged Oregonians to keep their Thanksgiving gatherings small and use precautions to protect themselves and loved ones from the spread of the virus. Unfortunately, now more than ever is the time we must double down on our efforts to stop COVID from spreading, Governor Brown said. Our situation is extremely dire. Our hospitals are stretched thin and people are dying. On Monday, following the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, state health officials will look at coronavirus data by county and assign a risk level to each. Extreme risk, high risk, moderate risk, and lower risk. Each level will have a corresponding health and safety measure to follow. The state will reassess county risk levels weekly, but the measures will not change until a county has spent at least two weeks at a new risk level. The hard reality is that there is no normal while the virus rages unchecked in the touch points of daily life, Patrick Allen, director of the Oregon Health Authority, said Wednesday. Going shopping, having dinner out with your friends, working out, it could all make you sick. Safety protocols at the extreme risk level mirror many of the restrictions Clackamas County saw briefly during the governor's two-week pause that actually lasted only a couple of days before the freeze set in. Social and at-home gatherings with people from outside your household will be limited to a maximum of six people with a recommendation of only two households. Restaurants and bars will be limited to a maximum of 50 people for outdoor dining only, with only six allowed per table. Takeout is strongly recommended. Gyms and other indoor recreation and entertainment establishments will remain closed in extreme risk areas, though such activities can resume outdoors with a maximum limit of 50 people. State health officials said that until COVID-19 vaccines are widely available, health and safety precautions will remain in place so that schools, businesses, and communities can reopen and stay open. OHA expects to receive a limited supply of vaccines as early as next month, which will be reserved for healthcare workers and the most vulnerable Oregonians. There is no healthy economy while COVID-19 circulates widely, said Allen, the OHA director. A majority of Oregonians are very or somewhat worried about catching COVID-19. Even before the freeze, most Oregonians reported cutting back on public activities. A healthy community is necessary for a healthy economy. The world is a little less bright without Clay Phyllis in it. 
But thanks to his family and the legacy he left behind, his home will shine as brightly as ever this Christmas season. Phyllis was the man behind one of Canby's most well-known holiday light shows, which he built at his home each year and even set to music. When he died of sudden cardiac arrest back in March, some presumed the display might have passed with him, but his family was determined to bring a little light to the corner of the world at a time when so many need it. My dad loved bringing joy to other people. Phyllis's daughter, Kayla Spicer, told Now Hear This Can Be. He loved Disneyland, especially the magic of it. Christmas lights were always a big deal at our house growing up. Spicer believed he drew inspiration for the light display from the 1989 holiday classic National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Disneyland, and other displays he had seen. He loved when people would stop to say how excited they were when he was setting it all up, she said. If people walked by and asked, he would turn on his speakers loud since they didn't have a car radio. Some of her favorite memories are of the family standing outside watching the show after they had finally finished getting them up. When we got too cold, we would go inside and have hot chocolate, she said. Dad always lit up when he talked about the lights. He wanted to make them bigger and better every year. One year, a little girl left a thank you card along with $10 for the electricity bill in her parents' mailbox. Oh, they were so touched, Spicer remembered. They used the money to buy an inflatable nativity scene that is now one of the display's centerpieces. Her father's passing was very unexpected. He worked out at a CrossFit gym almost daily and was healthy and fit. He was at home. He didn't feel anything, Spicer said. He was happy, though. Dad was blessed to have spent all the time with his family and friends in the months before he passed. He loved teaching kids and having grandkids was the best thing that ever happened to him. He learned to enjoy life more. It was never a question that the family would continue Phyllis's most beloved Christmas tradition, but it didn't mean that it was always easy. Oh, it's been a big learning curve for all of us, said Spicer, who lives with her husband and children a few blocks away from her parents. No one really knew how to hook up the lights to the controllers or run the computer program. I think we've got it almost figured out. The show will go on starting Thanksgiving night at the Phyllis home on Northeast 10th Avenue and Ivy Street. It will run nightly, 5 to 9 p.m. till the end of December. To get the full effect, tune your car radio to 105.7 FM. Spicer said a new song was added to the show this year in honor and memory of her dad. And on a personal note, I was a neighbor of Clay Phyllis for many years and received the benefit of his wisdom and generosity on many occasions and trust that his memory will be honored by this and give our condolences to the family. Thank you for continuing the tradition of Clay Phyllis. B14068 N7040. Hey, uh, Frankie, what are you doing? <sighs> well, I was trying to win this direct link pattern bingo game. That Hallmark gift basket is as good as mine. Direct link bingo game? You bet. Our local internet provider is hosting a virtual bingo game to show appreciation for their members. Isn't that cool? Yeah, super cool. Who does that? Direct link does. They miss seeing their members during these difficult times and wanted to offer a fun way to stay engaged and win some sweet prizes. They really do work hard to embody that cooperative spirit, don't they? Well, October is Cooperative Month, and DirectLink is a cooperative that was started back in 1904 by local farmers, so bingo kind of makes sense. They are one of roughly 260 remaining communications co-ops in the U.S. who provide connections over 40% of the land so that more than 50 million rural Americans have the technology that they need to thrive. Well, that's pretty unique. So how does bingo work? DirectLink members were mailed a bingo card at the beginning of September. Simply visit directlink.coop slash bingo or DirectLink Facebook page every weekday to get that day's bingo number and cross it off your card. They're playing four different simultaneous games with the blackout prize being a four-pack of tickets to a 2021 Mariners game. Okay, wow. Get out of my way. I gotta go get my card right now. <laughs> Good luck, you know, on everything except that Hallmark basket because, like I said, that's mine. Well, joining us again on the Canby Conversation today is Kathy Robinson. She is the director of the Canby Adult Center. Hi, Kathy. 
Hi, Tyler. How are you doing? We had you on the show um, back in March when all this was first starting. That feels like about a million years ago. It certainly does. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, how have things been going? <laughs> well, um, we're hanging in there. Things have been going. Um, obviously, we'd like to be open for mm -hmm. people, but since you and I spoke, if it's really been um, really back in March. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. We've tried we were, I remember part of the conversation was talking about these new things, these new face mask things. Oh my <laughs> you, word. you had just gotten some donated ones because their PPE was impossible to find. Right. Uh, and so, right. you know, uh, that was like a new thing. People are making these now. And now, of course, you know, <laughs> yeah. everyone's We've all, it's yeah. now the new wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Now, the, now the new fashion statement. Yeah. Well, gosh, since March. Um, we're continuing to do home delivered meals. Yeah. That's grown by about sixty percent. Okay, since the and that's beginning. stayed consistent. That has stayed consistent. Okay. Yeah, I mean every you know every week we get calls, some drop off and some come on, but it stayed stayed pretty consistent. We're serving um, again about one hundred and seventy individuals. Mm. Um, and it translates into about four thousand meals a month. Yeah, not everybody gets them seven days a week. So we've had to add a Meals on Wheels route. Um, we've reorganized the kitchen so that our drivers don't enter the building. Um, okay. They just pull up out front. We wheel all of the coolers with the hot and cold meals in them out the front door, uh -huh. and they just pull up and we load for them so that they're able to, you know, we're minimizing contact in the building. Previously, they would come in and load themselves? Yes. Okay. Under normal circumstances, they come in through a side door in the, in, in the dining room. Okay. and grab them and go out so yeah. um and we wouldn't be able to maintain this because it's a massive tripping hazard so everybody <laughs> just knows they gotta they've got to sort of clear the front area of when they're coming through have um, you brought on more drivers we brought on we had to add one route which meant more drivers okay. and there's always just there's always turnover on drivers so yeah. we've been really really lucky that again the community support has um has stayed consistent yeah um one challenge that we're having is that any any unaccompanied volunteer has to be um, background checked okay and that sits with the state of Oregon and they're backlogged sure so when we do need to get a Meals on Wheels driver cleared what normally took three weeks is now taking 10 to 12 weeks yeah so um, but so far it's okay I mean yeah. the drivers we have who are cleared we have some who are willing to step up and take a second route yeah know. I remember actually that that was part of our original conversation as well, that you were getting flooded with a lot of people wanting to know right. how they could help and That's wanting right. to volunteer, and you saying that unfortunately that was not as helpful as you wish it could be because That's of right. the need to background check and the That's backlog right. um, that especially back then was probably impossible when, yeah. when the state was first going to uh, telework. So. Yeah. Well, we weren't even trying to do them back then. Yeah, because well, there you go. Yeah. It, so yeah. that, now we're having to, now that this is turning into, uh, uh, you know, our new normal for yeah, at, yeah. Least, at least through the winter. Yeah. Um, we brought on some uh, Zoom, some offering some activities via Zoom. Um, actually, any moment now we'll be starting our Zoom bingo in the oh, next cool. room. And one of our, our, our transportation coordinator, who isn't driving now, she's really had to repurpose her job more than anybody. And so once a week, she's in there with seven or eight people playing cool. bingo for fun via yeah. Zoom. Um, our exercise instructor took her class to Zoom okay. within six weeks yeah. of the pandemic. So yeah. she's doing that out of her out of her garage, I think, yeah. which has been really great. Yeah. And um, especially excited about it as we're moving into winter because that's our concern, you know, yeah. through the summer. People garden, they get out walking, they're able to meet outdoors. Yes, but, um, it's a little I'm, easier to find yeah. uh, fill-in type or alternate type activities when right. it's nice to be outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're concerned moving into sure. the holidays. Um, I think that the response to today's drive-through is certainly an indication that people, you know, there's a fair number of people who are well, who are always on their own, but then on top of that, so many who have decided not to meet with family this year. So, yeah. um, you know, to serve 170 hot meals through a drive through that, that's a lot for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's tell people what what uh, you just mentioned was the Thanksgiving drive through Yes. It's happening on a Tuesday. People are listening to this on, or, you know, on or after Thanksgiving Thursday, this okay. episode, but we're recording this on Tuesday. That's when you did the, um, the drive through experience. You mentioned over 170 people, which is more than you would normally 
be able to fit in the building and no, more right. than you would normally serve on Thanksgiving, which was your, your biggest lunch. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. So that does, yeah, demonstrate quite, quite an uptick in need. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a full meal, as you mm -hmm. saw. Yeah. It, it filled you know, the bag. Even a little, was... little plastic uh, to-go container of cranberry sauce. Gotta have the cranberry sauce. I love that. Sauce. Gotta <laughs> have the so cranberry cute. sauce. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, and then who, who had to fill those is, back in the kitchen, Kathy? Who was I don't know. <laughs> just dribbling that in like a spoonful at a time. <laughs> Putting need the a, lid on. Need a pastry bag oh, and just, just squeeze it in. Just buttering curses. And <laughs> one down, 300 to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so you many. saw there was a lot left because the rest of that will go out tomorrow to the Humble Right, Everybody right, on and wheels, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, and we'll be doing something similar again the week before Christmas. Sure, It'll sure. be a different menu, but... Well, I have a few questions. So the Zoom activities, that's awesome. I'm curious about the attendance with that and, and how, um, you know, your clients, seniors in our community are, are handling that. It's obviously, we've all had to adapt to this Zoom kind of lifestyle, but um, sometimes the technological challenges can be a little more uh, challenging yes. <laughs> for seniors. Um, yes. ha have, has that been a big barrier to people? Or are they Are they figuring it out, obviously? You know, it's unfortunately it's a pretty small group of people who yeah. have both access to the technology and comfort with and a desire to learn. Yeah. Um, so I think our exercise instructor gets between eighteen and twenty five people. That's good. And a fair number of them actually weren't people who did exercise here physically, okay. but I think it's other people who receive our newsletter. Yeah. Um, whose you know gyms have closed and that kind of thing, and they say, well, I may as well hop on here and move it home. Yeah. Um, we've tried, uh, under normal circumstances, in any given month, we'll have four or five different speakers in the building. Yeah. People sign up and come in and hear about, you know, armchair travel to social um, to signing up for Medicare. Sure. Um, and we've tried to offer some of those things through Zoom, and they have not. They have not taken off, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Um, with a couple of exceptions. So I just I I, I kind of think that we've maxed out on the on the members in our community who are interested in um, in figuring it out yeah. and or have access to what they need to do it at yeah. home. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and through no fault of your own, that's just that's such a tough situation um, to to not be able to. Uh, have people in this wonderful facility that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I remember from our first conversation, and it's still something that you know is is heavy on on my heart, and I'm sure a lot of other people. Uh, but just how are you know you guys in, in normal times the, the lunches would be obviously a, a, a big time you know food would be this the centerpiece of it, but really a big time to get that social interaction to get out of their homes you know right. um, just the chance to to move around a little bit to see familiar faces and that is probably just as important if not more so than the food and that is something that can't happen and hasn't been happening for these past nine months now yep. um how are uh, that that's that's problematic right that that's tough for absolutely people. yeah tell us about that for folks absolutely. who don't know well i'm sure that again going back to the drive through lunch today i'm sure a good number of the folks who signed up and came through for some of them, it's the first time we've seen them mm. since March. Um, I saw a lot of like, oh, it's so good to see you. Yeah. And, oh yeah. my gosh. If you've been here at the beginning, like I said, they were backed up <laughs> here to the light and, and down to Ackerman because every person wanted to stop and, and as did we, you know, yeah. how are you doing? How's yeah. the grandkids, you know? And, yeah. and, and, um, and so I think that people did it for that reason. It's just sort of a mutual affirmation that, hey, I'm still here, and on our side, we're saying, hey, we're still here, and we're in it for the duration, and we'll be here, you know, once the doors are open again. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were here, you know, just seeing some some uh, folks go through more at the end, because um, we wanted to do this interview when it was a little slower. Right. Uh, so we kind of timed it out that way, but still saw a few people come through, and, uh, and we're taking pictures, and Kathy, the smiles that I saw on people <laughs> as they were driving away, like it almost breaks your heart. I mm -hmm. haven't seen a smile like that in a long time, I guess because we're all wearing masks. But. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, are there other ways uh, you mentioned the newsletter maybe that was something you've been before but other ways that you tried to um, you know obviously we talked about zoom but have tried to kind of keep those lines of communication open try to 
you know, speak into people's lives that are dealing with loneliness and isolation? Um, how, how has that been? What efforts have you been, been trying to do as far as that goes, and how's that been going? Well, we started soon after we closed our doors. We started with an initial calling list of like 250 people. We put every name and phone number that, um, that we had, and, yeah. and, and obviously a lot, an awful lot of them right away said, I'm fine, my daughter lives next door, whatever, mm-hmm. you don't need to call me. But we're down to a list of maybe 60 or 70 homebound seniors who um, a couple of my staff continue to try to touch base with every couple of weeks just wow. for that just for what you're saying yeah how are you in the in the early days it was do you need toilet paper yeah um, we worked with the police department to um for three or four people who needed medications picked up and didn't want to leave the house um by now people have sort of figured out their grocery shopping and, yeah. and getting their meds and all that but yeah. we do continue those calls and by this point, those 60 or 70 people, I think, are also feeling comfortable calling in yeah. if they've got a question. I mean, that list was really, really important for us during the fires. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of calls in, you know, people anxious. Again, if they are homebound and they don't drive yeah. and don't have family nearby, I mean, that created a lot of anxiety. So, so um, we do that. Uh, the newsletter, as you mentioned, goes out to about 550 households. Yeah. Um, and we really do, we try to keep it a combination of local news and here's where you can get takeout and here's what the library's currently doing yeah. and, and, um, and then, you know, a crossword and some corny jokes and all of that. Um, <laughs> we are doing also uh, in cooperation with an organization called Home Instead uh, Gift Tree. Okay. So oh, Fred cool. Myers that we've got, I think, 50, about 50 people who've submitted tags. We've done that for a number of years. Uh-huh. And I was really grateful Home Instead figured out a way to do it again this year. They're yeah. the driver behind that. Um, we have brought a couple of essential services back to the center very cautiously. One of them, believe it or not, is foot care. Okay. Because, again, once you can't reach your feet or if you have a, a medical condition where you can't feel your feet, yeah. getting regular, say, pedicures is becomes really important. Yeah. And so we started that back up in... August or September, we have two different RNs who come in and they set up in this room so that we just cycle out chairs. Um, you know, they've got a sink in here. They all have to be masked and they can come in for a safe pedicure just to keep their feet healthy. That's cool. Um, and then we've also brought back our medical rides program using yeah. just our paid drivers. We have a van that's got plexiglass, you know, behind the driver's seat. Yeah. And um, that is to get people to critical medical appointments. We uh-huh. go up to OHSU, to the VA, um, you know, Meridian Park, Oregon yeah. City. And, yeah. uh, and those are actually two of the services that I think we offer generally that are especially important to keep seniors at home yeah. and, and independent yeah. in their own homes, I yeah. guess is what I mean. So yeah. um, any way we can, you know, yeah. we send out for Meals on Wheels clients, they get a little bag of candy at Halloween, we're working on a simple craft to send out with people uh, for, uh, for Christmas. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, for those of us who aren't um, immersed in this world of, of serving our seniors as you and your your team are um what is kind of the the pulse <laughs> what, what 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 is kind of the the general feeling of, of seniors obviously when we first talked this was first hitting this was something that we were all kind of trying to figure out as you mentioned we now are much more immersed in this and much more um uh just veteran at the end of the right, pandemic right. Um, mm-hmm. you know we not not as many surprises yet I probably shouldn't say that but right. <laughs> yeah it's still it's still 2020 for a couple more months yet but um, <laughs> yeah, how are seniors uh, handling it I mean do, do you feel like um, are, are we seeing like I said just generally like are we seeing higher rates of depression and things like that are folks finding ways to cope now that we um, have you know been doing this for a while we definitely are seeing um, depression and anxiety mm-hmm. in, on, on the part of some of our folks. And yeah. again, as I more, said... More than as, we would normally. Yes. Yeah. As, again, as they're coming into holidays yeah. that they normally, you know, this is when my granddaughter Something normally flies in from yeah. California and she can't do it this year. So we're hearing a fair bit of that. Um, I think that people are, are very um, conscious of being safe. Yeah. I think that at this point, there aren't many people in our community who don't know somebody who's right. come down with COVID yeah. and unfortunately I mean my church community has lost three people oh, sorry. Um, 
and uh, and I think everybody's lives have now been touched in some way or another by that. And yeah. so people they understand that they are they are the population that really does need to stay put, but. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, and we're, um, again, trying to beef up some of those wellness checks and that kind of thing. It's, it's actually a statistic, which I can't directly quote, but that um, the month of February, late January and into February, brings the highest rate of, of death in this population. Yeah. The feeling being people sort of muscle through the holidays. Yeah. And then there's always this letdown yeah. after, right. and um, I mean, and I, I, I hope that's not what we see. And yeah. we obviously will continue to call people and yeah. and um, and uh, you know help them help them walk through it yeah. when when people reach out to us. But and then there's others who you call and they say, oh. I didn't go out that much anyway. I'm doing right. just fine. You right. know, I've right. got my crossword puzzles and so-and-so calls me and I do get together with my neighbor. We're both isolating. And, and so you definitely got a, a big group of people who, who are going to just weather this. They're, they're loving the fact that they don't have to get out of their <laughs> jammy pants <laughs> right. all day. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have people in our lives like that as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, Kathy, what, and maybe you haven't even had a chance to think, um, but what, what do you feel thankful for this year uh, as oh, we head gosh. into Thanksgiving? I know, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, are there things? <laughs> oh, and so much. Yeah, Absolutely. Sure. I, you know, I am thankful to, um, I have two teenagers hmm. in high school, and um, I am I'm A, grateful that they are in high school yeah. and able to navigate this online learning thing on their own. I yeah. just can't, can't imagine, um, you know, what, what families like yourselves with kids your, your age is oh, going to. Oh, you mean the to. children that are on top of my lap right now? As yes, they do this interview? exactly. <laughs> um, I am very, very, I'm thankful for the, for the school. I am, I am one who's a huge supporter, a huge fan. I think they're doing um, the absolute best job they can. I'm grateful for that. My immediate family, my nuclear family, is all in Canby. That's yeah. something to be very grateful for. And though, even though, because my eighty-nine-year-old mother, yeah. um, you know, is in that pool, so we're not piling all of us into her Hope Village Garden Home yeah. this year. Um, but we're still able to see each other often, and that's um, that's a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. Good, good. Well, last question, Kathy. Um, are there ways that people can help? Help what's going on. Help help seniors in our community. That uh, ways that are helpful. Um, certainly, a concrete way is to grab a tag on the giving tree, on okay. the gift tree. They just put it up at Fred Meyer yesterday, um, and I would add the Gwen's tree for the kids too. Yeah. I you know I think that Canby does a really really good job pulling together um, with these yeah. kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, uh, we are now accepting applications again for Meals on Wheels drivers okay. and for people who are able and you know willing to wait that process out with us. We yeah. would really, really love to beef, beef up our bench again. Yeah, um, and especially because you know we didn't mention this earlier, but a lot of your uh, volunteers and drivers tend to be in that vulnerable population as well. You know, and if there are younger people that have obviously you know there can be jobs and things or family responsibilities but mm -hmm. if there are folks that have the ability and the desire to help that maybe aren't as much at risk um this would yes. be a really great time to absolutely to just spend a few months helping out so, absolutely yeah absolutely yeah great yeah. well kathy thank you so much for for your positive attitude oh. and <laughs> and hanging in there i know it's been exhausting i know it's been long um, it's crazy to just look back over these nine months and again think back when we were first starting this and really not knowing what lay it lay ahead and to see you now and you guys are are handling it and we're just so yeah. grateful for you serving this really really vulnerable and important uh, and large <laughs> part yes. of our community so yes. thank you yes thank you sorry you heard the puppy yes I hope that, the that wasn't puppies. Up. <laughs> yeah that's another thing and then in a way that that folks are handling the isolation is getting puppies sometimes. getting getting puppies <laughs> yeah 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 well you gotta you gotta fill that time somehow absolutely <laughs>
Joining us now is Donna Ellison of Ellison Team Homes, a firm serving all across the Portland metro area with three realtors based right here in Canby. Donna, can you tell us how Ellison Team Homes started? I started in real estate. I grew up with my dad. He was a realtor. Mm -hmm. So I'm a second generation broker and I grew up with honestly with him on weekends and I learned a lot eventually working uh, with him for several years and then going out on my own. Our family moved to Canby a couple of years ago but we really didn't know how it was going to go and within the first probably three months of being here we literally fell head over heels in love with this place. We love the community, um, the spirit here. Um, The first Christmas at Wake Park I was literally crying because everybody was walking around saying Merry Christmas and people were drinking hot chocolate and we got in a carriage ride with the horse and (laughs) it was just too much. You just realize it's special here. Real estate's always been my passion. It is my professional love. I enjoy the people, the relationships. So much comes out of um, kind of the intensity that you spend with people. You're really up in their business for a period of time and sometimes it's a couple months, sometimes it's a couple years sometimes it's a lifetime yeah I feel very blessed at this point to have people that have been with me for almost my entire career Mm -hmm. clients that have bought and sold maybe two three four or five homes I have one client that's bought and sold eight homes with me yeah three generations it's a beautiful business it makes for a very full life Mm -hmm. how can people find you Um, How can they not, really? (laughs) (laughs) Um, We have a website, uh, www.ellisonteamhomes.com. Well, thank you, Donna. Thank you for having me. Can be then will conclude this episode of Down Here This Can Be, and it is brought to you by Retro Revival. They are not your average antique shop. They're open daily, and you can find them on the corner of Northwest 3rd and Grant Street in downtown Canby, or you can connect with them through email at retrorevivaloc at gmail.com. Based on real events, the 2008 film Changeling tells the story of a single mother whose son is abducted, then later returned, or is he? Police bring a boy whom they claim is her son, but she doesn't recognize him. When she refuses to accept the imposter, the authorities have her committed to a mental institution. A similar story, albeit one with a much older child and a much happier ending, happened right here in Candy in 1915. Two years earlier, in 1913, Oscar W. Sturgis, a well-known Clackamas County pioneer and Canby farmer, made a very difficult decision. He had his 40-year-old son, Charlie, committed to the state insane asylum in Salem. We don't know the exact circumstances of this decision, but we know Oscar Sturgis was in his 70s and his wife, 15 years younger, was also in poor health. It's a reasonable assumption that the Sturgises were unable to provide the level of care that Charlie needed. The Oregon State Hospital in the early 1900s was a dark and infamous place, which is not unusual in a time when mental illness was greatly feared and poorly understood. The hospital was underfunded and overcrowded. Later, its staff would infamously take part in the eugenics movement, sterilizing more than 2,600 patients over the years, and experimented with practices now considered barbaric, including electroshock therapy and insulin shock therapy, where patients were repeatedly treated with large doses of insulin to induce daily comas. Is it any wonder that in April 1915, less than two years after he'd been institutionalized, Charlie Sturgis escaped from the Oregon State Hospital? It was also probably not surprising to local officials when a body, an apparent murder victim, turned up in the mountains near Eugene, matching Charlie's description and wearing his hospital-issued clothing. Back in Canby, the Sturgises were informed of the gruesome discovery and sent a family friend, A.J. Burdett, to view the corpse. He positively identified it as Charlie Sturgis. The body was transported back home and laid to rest in a family plot at the Canby Oddfellow Cemetery. Months passed, and the family worked to move on and put the sad episode behind them. As the holidays drew near, one can imagine how heavily the tragic loss of their ill son must have weighed on their parents' hearts. I can only guess that they must have blamed themselves for his death. Then, on November 21st, four days before Thanksgiving, a knock came on the door of the Sturgis family home. It was Charlie Sturgis. 
miraculously alive, smiling, and in good health, mind, and body. The door had been answered by his sister, Bertha Hurst, who was dumbfounded to see the man she'd assumed had been buried months ago standing before her. When she recovered, she took Charlie to his old room and then went to break the news to their mother. She knew she had to handle this carefully, given her mother's fragile state of health. She asked, can you stand some news, which might be a little shock? Huh, yeah, I guess so, but what is it? Her mother replied. She explained that her brother was not dead. In fact, he had just come home, and her mother promptly fainted. Huh, we had to put her to bed and call Dr. Dedham, Bertha later recalled. When Oscar Sturgis was told the news, he had the same reaction. Charlie, of course, had no idea that he'd been pronounced dead, that he'd had a funeral, that there'd even been a body in a cemetery with a tombstone bearing his name. And his sister was reluctant to tell him for fear of the effect that this would have on his mental state. For this same reason, he was not told of the impact his return had had on his parents. Everything possible is being done to prevent Charles Sturgis from becoming excited the Oregonian later reported. The truth slowly emerged over the next several days. After escaping the state hospital, Charlie had traveled to Washington State, where he'd worked in various towns before deciding he missed home and wanted to see his family. But this, it didn't answer the big question. Who was the man buried in the Sturgis corner of the Canby Cemetery? And why was he wearing Charlie's clothes down to the patient number he'd been issued at the state hospital? Part of this was eventually answered when Charlie explained that he had actually escaped the institution in April 1915 with a group of patients. After getting away, they had all traded clothes before splitting up in order to confuse any authorities they encountered. But as to who he was and how he met his grisly fate, we'll probably never know. We can only assume that the details mattered little to the Sturgis family. Through a seeming miracle, the son they had known to be dead was returned to them, just in time for the holidays. And well, sometimes miracles don't need an explanation. Unfortunately, we were unable to pick up any threads of this fascinating story after 1915. If you knew anything about what became of Charles Sturgis and his family, please let us know. Get in touch with us on our website at canbefirst.com. Well, friends, that does it for us for this Thanksgiving episode of Now Hear This Can Be. I'm your host, James Walton. As always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great day and a very happy Thanksgiving. Hey, uh, Frankie, you, you okay? You seem kind of down. Yeah, I'm just bummed. Miss going to the wild hair. I know you can still get takeout and all, but it's just not the same. Uh, you, well, you know they're they're open again, right? What? Uh, yeah, they've been open for a while now. Don't you cover like the news? Hey, I'm only human, okay? Okay. Well, I can tell you that the wild hair and their amazing staff are thrilled to be open again for delicious meals and fun times. They are strictly following all the recommended safety guidelines, and they have the only covered outdoor patio in Canby, with lots of tables spaced six feet apart, and umbrellas also spaced six feet apart, and fantastic ambiance. And hey, if you're still more comfortable with carryout, they can hook you up there too. Find their menu and other information online at thewildhairsaloon.net or check them out in Canby in Oregon City. And anything to add, Frankie? Fra Frankie? Oh, I guess he left. God, he must have been really hungry. Now Hear This Can Be is produced by me, Tyler Clausen. Our content director and star reporter is Tyler Frankie. And of course, our show is edited by Cameron Clausen. We also feature the vocal talents of Joy Struby and James Walden. So a round of applause to them. The song that you're hearing right now is Can Be by singer-songwriter Olivia Harms, used with her permission. To find more work from her, you can visit her website, olivia13.com. Now Hear This Can Be is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. 
the production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned full service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe, and we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. I will take a motion to adjourn. I just moved it. I didn't even ask for it, though.